Hello, I'm Eric Citrenbaum, and this is the BC COVID-19 Modeling Group's COVID Model Projections for January 6, 2022. So here's our usual slide introducing the people behind the reports. I won't go through it in detail, but just remind you that we are an independent group of academics and affiliated individuals who are interested in providing an independent uh, analysis of um, the state of the pandemic, as well as developing models and statistical analysis for uh, projecting and um, helping with decision making. Okay, so quick overview of uh, this report. Um, so as you probably know, Omicron is now established and spreading within BC. Uh, the case rates are now at their highest um, that we've seen during the pandemic by quite a long shot, in fact. Um, so right now, the models tell us that Omicron is growing or was growing prior to Christmas uh, at about 21 to 26% per day, which corresponds to a doubling time of somewhere between three and three and a half days. Um, but now we've hit testing limitations, so uh, it's very difficult if not impossible to tell exactly what the growth rate is now. Uh, our testing capacity has been pushed to its limit, um, and which is why current growth rates are not uh, estimatable. And so at this point, testing is prioritized for people over 65, 65 and over, as well as those with underlying medical conditions. Um, and uh, the government has been providing people at, at, uh, at testing sites with uh, rapid antigen tests, which has helped to increase capacity, but the results of those tests are not publicly available. And um, it would be great if those results could be made available, even though they are probably not as reliable as PCR results, it would still help in estimating what's going on in the province. So the models continue to predict that demand on hospitals will be ex extreme through the coming month reaching higher levels than we've seen so far. Uh, and that's even though Omicron appears to be less severe than, for example, Delta or previous variants. So the rapid spread means that we have little time to act. Uh, maybe that's already a bit of a late statement here. Um, but the, the usual things would be useful. So getting vaccinated uh, is still um, uh, an important priority, even though Omicron is not uh, is not as affected by the vaccines, it's still the, they, there still is a significant effectiveness, especially for hospitalization. Uh, you know, uh, Omicron is transmitted largely air airborne, which means tight fitting masks are um, better than um, not so tight fitting masks. So N95s, for example, are better than cloth masks, etc. Uh, improving ventilation in indoor environments and avoiding large indoor gatherings, uh, which would limit uh, large spreading events, and improving rapid testing and uh, isolation of uh, infected individuals. All of these things are sort of still critical and important. Okay, so uh, instead of starting with the regular uh, state of the pandemic plot, which will come in a few slides, I'm just going to give an update on Omicron because this is where the, all the big questions still remain. So this is highlighting studies um, that are most relevant to what's going on in BC, but none of them are from BC. So uh, the question of how severe is Omicron, there's data from South Africa where they've seen a significant drop from about 16.6% of cases uh, ending up in the hospital down to 4.9% of cases. And those patients that are admitted were 73% less likely to have severe disease, where severe disease means uh, supplemental oxygen required, ICU care, respiratory distress, or in the worst cases, death. And they were released in half the time, a median of four days compared to seven or eight days for previous variants. Um, so th this is all a reflection of higher immunity in the population, as well as uh, a lower severity of Omicron. And it's hard to sort of tease out which of those two effects in South Africa uh, matter the most. And the balance is probably going to be different here at NBC. So a UK study... Um, which controlled for the immunity issue, so you know, accounting for vaccination or prior exposure, uh, 
um, found 35% fewer admissions to hospitals per Omicron case than per Delta case. Um, and for vaccinated individuals, they were much less likely to visit the hospital, 76% likely, less likely to visit for Omicron than they were would be for Delta. Uh, but unvaccinated cases didn't have uh, quite a drop, 26% less likely to end up in hospital. And a study from a recent study from Ontario found that um, 54% lower risk of hospitalization for Omicron versus Delta. So you got the references here in the actual PDF uh, on our webpage um, of this report. Those are uh, our links that can take you to those papers if you're interested in following up. So the the, the, the take home here is that Omicron, Omicron cases uh, are leading to hospitalizations less frequently, especially for vaccinated individuals and um, often more often result in shorter and less intensive care in hospital. So that's all good news. Uh, the bad news comes in the transmission, so transmissibility. So there's there's two reasons that Omicron is spreading more. One is that the vaccine effectiveness is decreased against Omicron and that transmissibility is higher. So here's a little summary of what we know about those things. Um, so the UK study uh, found that vaccine protection against infection with Omicron drops to near zero by 15 weeks, but is regained to high levels within a week of uh, boosting. So this, the, so the effect of the boosting is basically to uh, restart antibody production. And so you increase the level of antibodies in your body with a booster, and those antibodies are capable, even though they don't bind as well, perhaps, to Omicron, they are still capable of binding to it and preventing uh, entry into cells. So for a Pfizer two-dose regime that's in this box here, you can see that against Delta, the effectiveness dropped gradually over a period of 25 weeks, which is about six months. Um, against Omicron, the effectiveness starts lower than it did for Delta and drops more quickly. And by about 20 weeks, so say five months, um, you're getting pretty close to no effectiveness out of that. But a booster with, in this case, Pfizer here or Moderna here, brings back that effectiveness um, uh, to a, a higher level, not quite the same level as seen for uh, Delta, but um, pretty high. And again, it starts to come down after weeks, but it re rejuvenates that effectiveness quite a bit. And then uh, the transmissibility issue, there was a Danish study that found Omicron to be only slightly more tr transmissible among unvaccinated uh, households compared to Delta. And th um, they attributed Omicron's rapid spread primarily to its ability to infect vaccinated individuals. In other words, the drop in, in vaccine effectiveness is a greater indicator of, or a, a greater cause for the change in spread than the actual transmissibility. Um, but uh, there's a tissue-based study that found that Omicron replicated 70 times faster in bronchial tubes and 10 times slower in lung tissue. So, um, so what this says, what, you know, the sort of take home there is that Omicron may replicate less well in lungs and more in airways, potentially accounting for the lower severity. Uh, severity of respiratory infections is largely determined by how deep in the lungs the infection causes damage and how much damage it causes there. Um, and then has having slightly higher transmissibility. So infections that um, affect higher parts of the respiratory tract tend to be more transmissible. And so that's, uh, that's what this study suggests. Okay, so here is my usual starting slide. Uh, this is the state of the pandemic overview, going back all the way to March 2020 here with our second wave here, our third delta wave here, sorry, our third alpha wave here, and our fourth delta wave. And now you can see the wall of Omicron. In contrast to our previous report, we can see the effect of Omicron across the province. We see this sharp uptick in cases everywhere in all uh, all health authorities and uh, essentially in all health regions. 
And all this is also keeping in mind that testing has become uh, much less complete now. And so you can see here, uh, the flattening that we're seeing here is um, probably not because cases are flattening or infections are flattening, but because um, testing capacity has been reached. So, um, so this data gap is a big issue, especially for us trying to do any projections based on data. So what, what we have here is cases plotted in red or orange here and wastewater measurements for uh, Metro Vancouver in blue. Now, obviously they're, they've been scaled, you know, they have completely different units, one's concentration, one's number of individuals infected, but they're just been, they've been scaled here so you can see uh, uh, the potential for using one as a surrogate for the other. And so what you see is a fairly good uh, correspondence between increases in case numbers and increases in wastewater concentration. And so that's true all the way till recently, where we are seeing the effect of Omicron in the wastewater data. Unfortunately, uh, the wastewater surveillance data has not been updated since December 20th. But that data would be great to have and use as a tool for filling in the gap. Okay, so um, here's an analysis. This is a, a repeat uh, type of analysis. Dean Carlin introduced this analysis a few reports back. And what he's done is he's introduced a model for tests. So what, it, what the model does is if you know um, how many cases there are in a given week or day, um, the model will be able to take that number and predict how many tests you would expect. But now you can see clearly that um, the test data is not rising anywhere near as quickly as the case data would predict. So that tells us that we're under testing. And this, I think this was clear to everybody, but here's just data to illustrate that. Okay, so uh, how big is the data gap? Can we actually do something to estimate it? This is, um, this is an attempt to understand the gap. And so this is all on a log scale. So when you see exponential growth on a log scale, it turns into straight lines. And that's what you can see here in Vancouver Coastal. This, the green here is individuals age 70 and up. Now, because people under 65 were discouraged from testing, um, we only have data for the co age cohorts in blocks of 10 here. So we're just looking at 70 plus. That ought to be a better tested subpopulation than the entire population. So our hope is that this trend here is correct and the flattening out of the data for the under 70 is probably incorrect and the black dashed line is using the trend here among the 70 plus to fill in the gap for the 70 and under. And so uh, you can see from that what the gap is and if you you know translate that you know back here what you can you, what you'll see is that um, using this age correction technique the estimated number of cases detected on january 3rd would have been 8115 instead of 2230 which is a factor of 3.6 so um, that's the estimate that we have for uh, how far under-reported uh, things are. So uh, just to understand what the implications are, um, first of all, uh, individuals can't assess the risks they face. So here's a table that kind of assesses that. Uh, let's see, the other issues here, the effect of recent public health measures can't be determined. So we have a whole bunch of new measures that went in place just before Christmas, and um, we, we can't see the regular turnaround or bend in growth or whatever they're going to cause. So it's hard to gauge what the impact is going to be. Um, and then, you know, projections of how many people and how long it'll take for that peak to be reached, as well as estimating hospital demand, which is a critical issue this month, um, are going to be, you know, much harder to do if, if possible at all. All right. So um, here's uh, Dean Carlin's model with the Omicron variant included here in purple. And then the green is cases. So you can see our Delta peak back here in September and then coming down steadily throughout the fall. And then the Omicron turnaround and rise. 
Um, and so what you can see is there's clearly similar problematic growth in all health authorities uh, across the board. The fit here is only carried out up until the point where the case data has sort of flattened in an unreasonable way in the sense that um, you know this point here or here is where we have probably gone astray in terms of our you know hitting our testing capacity. So we we'll zoom here just to see a little bit more detail on that same plot and you can see here the estimate for the overall growth rate in the province is 21 percent per day. So through the next few slides uh, what I'm going to show is uh, Dean Carlin's uh, model for what could happen over the next six weeks or so. Um, there's a lot of unknowns, and so there's some variability that's described here in this table. And so what you'll see through the next few slides is, um, for example, what if the transmission rate remains constant through the entire period? And then uh, what happens if it is reduced by, say, 50% either in December or at different points in January, uh, where here we're thinking about um, introducing um, measures that might be able to reduce transmission. And then um, this one here is, you know, uh, he's assuming in the sort of nominal case that that vaccine effectiveness is 20% corresponding to a lot of the population having uh, had their second dose already months ago. Um, and so if, if that vaccine effectiveness is incorrect or if it is uh, somehow increased let's say by boosters so we'll see what happens in that variation um, and then uh, we're not entirely certain that the fraction of omicron infections that are identified and reported is the same as earlier variants so we assume that it is the same which is roughly half of all cases uh, are uh, identified and then we have a hypothetical in which um, a smaller fraction of those um, are identified as were previously so in other words there are many more silent infections that are uh, unidentified and see what impact that has on the time course of the uh, epidemic and then finally the f uh, what fraction of omicron infections require hospitalization so um, the nominal number is 0.3 times the hospitalization fraction of earlier variants. That's roughly what we get from data. And then if that data is incorrect and it goes down to as low as 0.1 or as high as 0.5, we can see what happens in those scenarios. Okay, so let's see what some of these trajectories look like. So you can see here in green the case data um, with the fit to date that I showed earlier, and now uh, assuming that we're missing about half of the actual infections, you can see here the yellow curve. Uh, the projection is that you know the number of infections will rise to a peak in mid-January and then begin to come down. Now we're on a log scale here. Notice there's a thousand, ten thousand, uh, and a hundred thousand. So in this case, what Dean has done in the dotted data in the dotted projection line is assume that the measures that were introduced in BC on December 21st were effective in reducing the growth rate from its current 20% per day to 10% per day. And what you see is a delay in the peak and a decrease in the peak. So for a peak of over, uh, over 100,000, so 200,000 daily cases. And that would come down to under 100,000 cases. So if you, you follow those, maybe that's down to 80,000 cases per day. So still very large numbers. And then if you look at the hospitalization impact, you can see the same thing. In blue here is the number of individuals in hospital. And so that would come down from a peak somewhere around early February to a later peak somewhere in mid-February and at a slightly lower level. But it's still a fairly high peak. Okay, so that's if uh, our measures from December 21st were effective in bringing down the transmission rate. Here you can see what happens if the reduction in transmission rate is delayed to start uh, January 5th. Uh, then you would see uh, a similar drop in peak and a sim similar delay but to a lesser extent and we still have a very high peak. And finally, a late reduction in transmission, January 20th, uh, 
and you basically don't have any real impact on the time course of uh, infections or hospitalizations. Okay, so in this slide, Dean is showing what happens if we change the um, the assumed value for the vaccine effectiveness from 20% and increase it to 50%. So that is just assume throughout that we have uh, an incorrect estimate for the vaccine effectiveness. Now, throughout this model, there's ongoing uh, vaccination and um, and boosters. And so that's been included here. This is just a correction of uh, an, a parameter estimate. So just suppose that the 20% assumption is incorrect and things are actually a little bit better than that. And what we see is very little change in the, in the, in the rise in cases. And eventually there's an impact in the height of the peak and it delays it, or sorry, um, it, uh, what's it not postpones, prepones. Um, <laughs> do we have a word for that? Well, Okay, there it is. I'll call it prepones. So it prepones the peak slightly, uh, but then you see a similar but time shifted drop off from that peak. And similarly for hospitalizations, earlier peak, lower but not dramatic. So in this slide, we're testing what happens if the fraction of Omicron uh, infections reported is not the same as for other variants, but instead is actually 30% that number. So for other variants, it's roughly what we've seen is, or what, what roughly what's been estimated is that um, for every 100 infections, uh, about 50 of them will have been identified as a positive case through PCR testing. And now we are comparing here if that holds for Omicron, and that's the solid yellow curve. And then the dotted yellow curve is if that number drops to 15, that's 1.5, out of 100 cases. So in other words, many more mild cases that go undetected out there. So what we see is that when we assume that the number of identified uh, or reported infections is 30% lower, we see that there's a shift in the curves. So in other words, the peak is reached about a week earlier, uh, but very little else about the trajectory is changed. So there's not a huge difference in the peak number of infections, but you'll notice there is a large difference in the peak hospitalization. So, and what you see here, it's not obvious here on a log scale, but this, this corresponds to a threefold difference uh, at the peak. So why is that happening? Basically, um, you know, we're, we're fitting the data to the cases, not to the infections. And so if we're way off on how many infections there are currently, then we've got a lot more people that have been infected. And from this point on, there will be fewer people hospitalized. And so the hospitalization peak is going to happen earlier and less people will be in hospital. So on this slide, we're looking at uh, severity and what you see in the solid yellow curve and the dashed yellow curve, which is completely superimposed, um, but you'll see differences, dramatic differences in hospitalization numbers. So the solid yellow curve and solid hospitalization curves over here correspond to Omicron uh, requiring hospitalization at a rate of 30% of what previous variants required with the duration uh, of, for hospital stay of 0.4 or 40% of the other variants. And so that's the solid yellow curve, the dashed yellow curve, actually there's two of them in there. You can see them broken out here in the hospital admissions or the hospital occupancy and ICU counts and so on. Um, so the difference here is that we've dropped that 0.3 down to 0.1 or raised it to 0.5 just to see what if it's incorrect in either direction. And the length, the duration of hospital stays kept constant in all of those cases. Uh, okay, and so not surprisingly, because we're not changing the time course of infection at all, just what fraction of those infections end up in hospital, these overlap all exactly. And what you can see in this data is that if you raise the fraction of individuals going to the hospital by f up to 50%, you get, a, you get an increase in the peak. And if you decrease it to 0.1 or 10% of cases, you see a fairly large decrease in the peak. So in this and the next few slides, I'm going to show you Sally Otto's age-based model projections.
uh, and the goal is to understand a bit better um, how cases and numbers in hospital due to Omicron will evolve over the next little while, uh, taking into account vaccination status and hospitalization rates by age. So in uh, the previous report, I told you about some of the work she'd done with this model, but she had been varying some of the parameters. Here she's fixed things that were not as clear before, but have since had better uh, data made available. So you can go through those and see how these uh, values have changed. Um, but uh, let me just go through the simulation results and hopefully some of this stuff will make sense as I go through it. So here what we're looking at is um, uh, new infections per day uh, and it's broken out by age it's here from um, uh, the 0 to 10 all the way up to 90 plus age cohorts. And down here you can see the data in black that we're, we're relying on and the white dots here are from where we believe the um, testing capacity had already been reached and, and the data isn't really reliable. So fitting this data uh, to the cases, the infections, number of infections will ride above that because Sally's assuming that only one quarter of the total number of infections get identified. Uh, and so w what you see when you have, so the comparison that she's doing on this slide is what happens when you have no boosters in the population and then what compared to what if you have all 60 plus individuals in the population given a booster before exposure. And so um, the difference that we see is a peak, uh, it doesn't change in terms of its timing, but its amplitude does drop quite a bit from over 200,000 down to just over 150,000, but it's still way above our hospital capacity. Um, as you can see, you know, comparing, well, at least this is, uh, let's see, this is uh, the maximum number of cases we've seen. So to figure out what this looks like in terms of hospitalizations, I'll flip a couple slides. So what we see here is the projected number in the hospital um, by age. And um, you can see that with no boosters, you, the number of hospitalizations are going way over uh, 10,000. That's a hospital occupancy. And if all individuals over the age of 60 are given boosters, then that peak hospital uh, occupancy value comes down to under 8,000. Now, under 8,000 is still well above the maximum we've seen so far, and our capacity is not far above that. So we're clearly still way above capacity in that case. So um, the second uh, variation that uh, Sally's done from the top panels to the bottom panels. Here she's been assuming a 12-day average hospitalization stay, which was the case pre-Omicron. But given that the hospital length of stay now has dropped down by a factor of roughly a half, what you get in that case is a corresponding decrease in the um, the maximum hospital capacity. But it's still going nearly or above, let's see, yeah, right around 4,000 uh, individuals in the hospital, which still is going to be uh, above uh, the ability of our hospitals to uh, to manage. So uncertainties in these projections. So it's, is it possible that we're uh, we're going to be wrong about the hospital demand? Um, so where where could that uncertainty come from? So the first place that uncertainty is hiding is in the reduced severity relative to delta. We, we have better estimates than we had before, but they're still not absolutely certain, of course. Um, and if, it, if it's much less certain than what we've estimated, um, then um, you know, the peak hospital demand could be reduced. Um, we've already included the observation of shorter hospital stays, so down by about uh, 50 or 60 percent. Uh, and the two studies that I showed adopted each of those numbers. Um, and so that if those are incorrect, if the stays are even shorter in BC for whatever reason, then that would decrease our, um, our, our peak hospitalization demand. And um, the other one is if the symptoms are so mild that we're really underestimating the number of uh, unidentified infections out there, um, as I described earlier uh, in a few slides, uh, 
um, then uh, that that could bring our peak down as well and and, and lead to uh, incorrect estimation here okay so um, here's a, a slide I think this is our last slide before the summary um, so what is our immunity like in uh, in BC so the risk of COVID-19 for an unvaccinated person relative to a fully vaccinated person has taken a, a, a steep drop. So being unvaccinated uh, it increased the relative risk of infection by an average of 8.8 fold before Omicron. So in other words, getting vaccinated decreased your, your risk of getting infected by a factor of almost nine. Uh, but this has now declined to only a 1.5 fold for Omicron. So you can see that in the graph here. We started off with Delta. You had uh, a high ratio of risk between vaccinated and unvaccinated. And then with the appearance of Omicron, we've seen a sharp drop off. However, hospitalizations, uh, that's a different story. The risk of hospitalizations so far remained stable at about a 20 fold. Uh, difference. So in other words, an unvaccinated individual is about 20 times as at risk for ending up in the hospital as a vaccinated individual. Okay, so the key messages from the, the, from the report. Uh, so Omicron is clearly underway here in BC and all health uh, authorities. Um, and the doubling time is in the three to three and a half day range. Uh, different models agree on the impact on the healthcare system, and that's going to be extreme throughout the coming month. So, the, you know, the modeling really indicates that um, there's going to be a need for expanded hospital capacity. Uh, however, we could pull that off. So what we've seen elsewhere tells us that those that do end up in the hospital are going to be better off than they were for previous waves. Uh, this is reflected in both the reduced ICU numbers and uh, other you know, more severe cases in the hospital and the shortened hospital stays. Uh, testing capacity has definitely been exceeded. I mean, we suspected this, but the data really shows it. Um, and that means that our daily case counts are going to be useless going forward for projections. So to fill this gap, data on rapid antigen re results or sick days uh, or wastewater, uh, all these other methods are going to be important, but we actually need the data. Unfortunately, there's no, no uh, data from rapid antigen result reporting yet. Hopefully there will be. And wastewater from at least Metro Vancouver uh, their data is still lagging. So those would be great improvements to see. Um, and um, uh, you know, even a representative sampling strategy to estimate prevalence in the community uh, would, would be useful to have. Um, but if it's not done rapidly, it's not going to be all that useful because we'll be done with this wave. So now just to summarize uh, the uncertainty in our modeling. So there's still a great deal of uncertainty, uh, in particular current infection rates in BC. Uh, estimates uh, of severity and immune protection vary from study to study. That makes it challenging to forecast the impact of the Omicron wave. Uh, most projections that we've discussed here uh, show a peak in January, and that's really robust unless there's a significant change in growth rates. Um, the, the height of the ensuing hospitalization wave, though, is, is harder to estimate. More parameters have an influence on that one. Um, and, uh, you know, following the severity estimates from other jurisdictions will improve things and hopefully we'll have better uh, grip on uh, what's going to happen for our next report. So in both of the models that uh, I discussed here in this uh, in this report talking about the hospitalization peak, uh, it, it, you know, predict that it'll be anywhere from a factor of four to 10 higher than any previous levels that we've seen. So that is our report for January 6, 2022. Uh, stay safe, wear masks, avoid large groups, dot, 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 all the things. And I hope you keep well until our next report.